Welcome back to Let's Go. Last time we learned from Jesus and his apostles why it is so important that we listen to others. And we learned some techniques to help us listen more carefully. Next, we are going to learn how we can overcome our fear of knowing what to say after we have listened carefully to someone. And you might be surprised to find out that it actually involves more listening. Let's find out more. There is something incredibly freeing when we learn to say, I'm going to understand this person as well as I can, however long it takes. I cannot overstate the degree to which it changes how I experience high pressure situations when I simply seek first to understand. I'm thinking especially about the pressure of knowing what to say. You may feel that you cannot be involved in witnessing conversations until you have an encyclopedic grasp of every possible answer to every possible question. Maybe you worry about freezing up when something difficult or deeply personal comes up. That's what I mean by the pressure of knowing what to say. Seek first to understand, then and only then to be understood means setting that pressure completely aside. You don't even need to worry about that as you give yourself all the time you need to explore the other person's story or their skepticism about Jesus and what it's really all about for them. Maybe it's better to say that you postpone the pressure we often feel having to do with what am I going to say to such and such person with such and such issues. The obligation we take on instead for as long as seems useful is gaining a more complex view of the person before us. And we will do this rather than contradicting people at our first opportunity or immediately trying to form our response all the while they are trying to be heard. What does that actually sound like? Here's just one example that will serve to just introduce the idea of active listening that we will work with in the next lesson. I remember a conversation with a man who told me that the church is full of hypocrites. This was his reason for not giving Christians the time of day, and more importantly, for not giving Jesus a second thought. The church is full of hypocrites. The person who seeks first to understand will realize that there is more to this man than this objection. There's more to this story. Ask yourself what you might have said. Pause the video for a moment to give yourself that opportunity. What do you say to the person who says the church is full of hypocrites? So pause the video for a few minutes and discuss this question, then resume the video. So, what did you come up with? I actually hope what you would say is, what do you mean by a hypocrite? He will answer you, perhaps by talking about Christians not living up to what they say they believe. And you may actually have several more opportunities to ask, and what do you mean by that? At a certain point, you may transition to another question that you can ask in different ways. For example, how have you come to think this way? Or how have you reached this conclusion? This is where their story may begin to slowly unfold right in front of you. As it turned out in the conversation I'm remembering, I thought the man and I had come to a good understanding of hypocrisy. I explained that Jesus himself agrees with the man and that Jesus is more bothered than he is by the bad fish among the good and by the weeds among the wheat, as Jesus put it. But we were still somehow not getting anywhere. As a reason to deny the truth of Christ, something wasn't making sense. That is, until I happened to stumble on the active listening skill called reflecting feeling. Just for a moment, I stopped dealing with his spoken objections and noticed the strong emotion on his face and in his voice. I said something like, Bill, I understand what you're saying and I'm agreeing with you, but you seem so angry. And he replied, you're blank, 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 right, I am angry, and proceeded to tell me about the death of his father and the cruelty he felt he'd experienced 
at the hands of devout believers. The conversation didn't suddenly become easy, but we had at least begun to have the right conversation, and it was about something else entirely. What do you say about the charge of hypocrisy? How about, what do you mean by that? And why do you think that's true? Because I really want to know. Have you ever experienced a time when you asked someone what they meant by what they said, and their answer surprised you? Please pause the video and take a few minutes to share such an experience with the others in your group. The Colombo Approach comes from a book by Greg Kuko called Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. The method is inspired by the rumpled, head-scratching detective on the old TV show who had the knack for being non-defensive and non-confrontational with his suspects. I also removed it myself recently because I had second thoughts. What do you mean by second thoughts? He would maintain a posture of something like, there's something I don't quite understand here. You gotta help me. In the conversations we're envisioning in this course, you can spend as long as you like asking the following questions in response to what people tell you in that same non-threatening way. What do you mean by? What does it mean when you say? Or help me understand this. This is where you genuinely accept the burden of understanding and generously explore the other person's meaning. Why do you think that's true? How have you come to think that way? This is where you draw out the other person's story that seems to them to make their view of Christianity make sense. Or you call up whatever evidence or rationale is getting in the way for them. The third kind of question is when you ask, well, have you thought about such and such? This is where, if you are ready, you at last begin to introduce your message or the truth as it relates to the particular person before you. You're in no hurry to get here, of course. You do not need to be locked up in the fear of the possibility of not having any answer at all. The conversation may stray into things you've not deeply studied. For example, the overwhelming evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, or the overwhelming reasons to take the New Testament at face value. Let's say the person comes at you with in misinformation about those issues, citing, for example, the so-called Gospel of Thomas or the hallucination theory about the resurrection of Jesus. You need only say if this happens to you, well, you've clearly thought more about this than I have. Do you mind if I look into that and we talk about this again? You've lost nothing. The whole while you were treating the other person with true kindness and genuine interest, you have modeled gentleness and respect. The value of Kukul's book is in draining the anxiety from those situations, helping you to understand that the goal is simply to get up to the plate, that is to be in those conversations. That's a win all by itself, and it can start right now. It can, it can start today no matter how much or little you think you know. You will learn so much from those encounters, and you will gain more and more good things to say over time. You will find more and more ways to, as Kukul says, put a stone in the shoe of the other person in that third piece in which you are able to insert something that is reliable and true, as we know it from the Word of God, by simply saying, have you thought about this? Having listened out of a genuine loving desire to understand, you can ultimately learn to ask, have you thought about this? Let's give this a try. Please choose a partner as we role play using the Colombo approach. Each person will take a turn being the skeptic and also the witness. In this scenario, the skeptic's objection is one we discussed earlier, namely that he believes Christians are hypocrites. Now, when it's your turn to play the skeptic, ask yourself what might make a person come to believe that? What might they mean by that? And so as you play this role, play it as a skeptic, also who is thoughtful and kind. In other words, I ask you to keep the role play light 
rather than having strong feelings that can easily escalate and defeat this, this process. So stay calm, be nice. When you play the role of the witness, ask the what do you mean by that question just as often as you can think of a way to meaningfully ask it. Next, ask the how have you come to think this way question. As often as it seems to help to open up a worthwhile conversation and create understanding. If you do have a have you thought of this question to ask, by all means do so. Just don't be in any hurry to get there. Before trying this out for yourself, take a look at this short demonstration to give you an idea of how it might look. In this scenario, the skeptic's objection is that Christians are intolerant. So this is Jacob. Jacob is playing the role of a pretty serious skeptic about the Christian faith. And this is Leah. Leah is playing the role of a Christian witness who wants to be the best listener she can. Go ahead, Leah. So Jacob, I've gotten the impression that you kind of have a problem with Christianity, is that right? Well, Christians are just so intolerant. Okay, what do you mean by intolerant? They're kind of a bunch of bigots. Okay, I don't think I quite understand. What do you mean by, like, bigotry? You know, close-minded, uh, judgmental. Okay, so you notice that the listener can stay in this mode of listening just as long as she feels she needs to, just to understand what this person is trying to say and what he really means by it. At some point, she can transition to a new kind of question. So go ahead. So what made you think that um, Christians are all judgmental and bigoted? Well, there was this one girl at school who constantly would tell me that, you know, God wasn't okay with what I was doing and would try to push their views upon me and I just wasn't comfortable with that. Okay, I can see how that would be hard, but how did you come to think that this one girl represented all of Christianity? Well, it wasn't just one girl. I mean, there were others who did similar things and were close-minded and wouldn't necessarily always listen to what I had to say. So again, you can see that Leah can stay in this mode just as long as she feels like she need to. needs to. She's simply asking, um, how have you come to think this way? She's drawing out the story of how Jacob has come to hold these opinions. Now, if she's ready, she may actually transition to a third kind of question based on experiences maybe that she's had before. So, go ahead, Leah. So, have you thought about how you're looking at just a few people and using that to represent, like, your view of Christianity as a whole? So, the have you thought about this question is where she begins to interject her own point of view based on a really serious understanding of the person that she is listening to that God willing can lead to a further testimony. Take a few minutes now to role play the Columbo approach. Remember in your role play, the skeptic's position is that Christians are hypocrites. Please pause the video now as you give the Columbo approach a try. After you are done discussing, please resume the video. I'd like to wrap up this session by having you consider the power of the open question and to try to have some experiences using that skill between now and the next session. Yes, this is homework. An open question is one that causes a person to reflect. They probably won't answer it the same way if you asked it again some other day. It may send them deep inside. It may start with the words what or how or tell me about, or even help me understand. The word why is a way to ask an open question as long as the tone is not rude or too intrusive. A closed question often has the word you as a second word in the sentence. Do you? Were you? Are you? These questions can be answered with yes or no. Of course, people can treat closed questions as if they are open questions. For example, if I ask you, are you worried about this? You might say yes, and then go on to explain your feelings. However, open questions have more power to guide a conversation to even more significant places. So for your homework, 
I'm asking you to use open questions to see what sort of spiritual conversations you can have with Christian people in your life. It's a wonderful thing to do. And it may feel a whole lot safer as a place to hone this skill when you are among fellow believers. So, for example, tell me a hymn verse or a scripture that means so much to you right now. Or, what should I be praying for when I think of you? Or, where is God in all your struggles? What is happening with your faith right now? Now, we don't want a person to feel like they are being interrogated and we generally want the conversation to be mutual in the way we also make disclosures and share our own ideas and stories. So you can intersperse those things in a way that only helps the conversation to be both interesting and important. I found that having spiritual conversations with the people I hope to witness to just is not rocket science. We need not be clever, only a little bit courageous. Hey, do you mind if I ask you, do you believe in God? Yes, that's a closed question, but it's still a great one. And as I, as I think of it, there is not an inexhaustible list of the very most important things we can talk to people about. We can ask about who or what we love, or who loves us and how. We can ask them about meaning or identity, as we cause them to think about where they find those things and how vulnerable those sources are and the way they bring intolerable pressure or inevitable crushing loss. We can ask about what sort of control a person has or doesn't have when it comes to things that mean the most to them. And what does that do to them to not have control? And then we listen. In genuine fascination and interest in people other than ourselves, we will ask our fondest questions of the people we long to get through to. And we will ask our questions from a heart that genuinely wants to know, even to set ourselves aside and be drawn out of ourselves into their world. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. Ask a few powerful open questions of the people you know well. And please come to the next session with your most compelling examples. See you then. So, now you know why listening is so critical to our task of proclaiming the gospel, and you learn some ways you can listen more carefully to others. Next time, you are going to be given the chance to practice what you have learned. I think you will find it fun as well as helpful. See you then.